Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel, or ARC. I'm Ed Baker, and I am your host producer. Today, we're very fortunate indeed to have with us two distinguished guests. We have with us Dr. Todd Mandel, who is a board-certified psychiatrist with a specialty in addiction psychiatry. And we have Cam Lauf, who is a certified recovery coach right here in Vermont, uh, presently working with the um, Turning Point Center of Chittenden County in a number of roles, and we'll probably hear about all of them today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, gentlemen, so much thanks for being for on the show. Back. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is uh, part two in a, put, a, part two, uh, a two part series uh, focused on the American Society of Addiction Medicine's expanded uh, definition of addiction. In 2011, ASAM released its um, definition of addiction. It was mainly focused on brain circuitry. Since 2011, the American public, for the most part, has come around and begin, began to understand that addiction is not a, a moral weakness, it's not a character flaw or a, a criminal personality, it's a medical disease. The 2019 definition is meant to expand on that, the idea of brain circuitry, but also to include some very important dynamics, the dynamics between the person and the environment. I'll read from the commentary, the ASAM commentary. They say that this definition, the new definition, recognizes that people do not develop the disease of addiction in a vacuum. The updated definition underscores the complex interplay of unique biological, psychological, and environmental factors. And by environmental factors, what they mean is what we call adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, hunger, uh, poverty, uh, difficulties with employment, difficulties with housing, that these types of environmental stressors can interact with brain circuitry in ways that both can cause the beginning of addiction, perpetuate addiction, and also either thwart or encourage recovery. And I would like to, I'd like to begin there with my guests. I'd like you both to think about your careers, think about your interactions with people with substance use disorder and addiction, and comment on the way that you have observed the environment interacting with brain circuitry causing, causing stress. Mm -hmm. Why don't you start, Kim? I'll start. So I can speak a little bit about my own um, sort of path through recovery, and I can also speak about what I've witnessed in my work in the emergency department. Yeah. Um, I had a, my father passed away at a very young age. My mother had cancer at around the same time, so I was pretty stressed out. There was a lot of stuff happening. All at once and then throughout the years I kind of had different outlets which gave me sort of that reward I'd get that kind of dopamine response from like playing sports uh, going to school getting decent grades I was never a good student but you know I did okay um, up until the point where I started using substances where I had this sort of relief you know mm. so you can say that the environmental factors of my father passing away my mother having cancer mm. all these you know sort of tragic things happening in my life sort of laid the pathway for me to become vulnerable to developing um, this disease. Um, and what I see in the emergency department too is I see sort of like a compounding of factors where it's you can have the genetics that lead up to it, you can have the environmental factors, and you can also have the tra uh, traumatic events. And particularly the traumatic events is what I've seen sort of lead to this um, progression of this disease. So we'll see people coming in possibly for their first time in the emergency department where they're struggling with use and then we might see them about a year down the road and we see the progression yeah. where it might have started with maybe a mild substance use disorder to the point where now it's progressive right. you know so their use is now problematic and they're using past those uh, consequences yeah you have those negative consequences which are arising in their life one of them could be entering the emergency department, and then they're still here. They're still sort of resurfacing. 
Well, you know, that's just let me take a second because that's a really interesting point. Mm -hmm. One of the other major points that ACM makes is they differentiate, which is what you're doing, between um, mild and moderate substance use disorder mm -hmm. and addiction proper. Mm -hmm. They reserve the term addiction for severe substance use disorder, which means that the brain is compromised in ways that causes the person to continue in addictive behaviors in spite of consequences. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting that you made that point because they make that same point. Mm -hmm. what, what about, uh, Todd, what about your career? What have you observed? <clears throat> Very similar to what Cam describes, <clears throat> folks coming to treatment, <clears throat> bringing with them a variety of issues, depending on whether it's their first time around <clears throat> or having been in, mm, made attempts at treatment and recovery many times over the years. Um, the part of recovery that seems to be a challenge for many people is how do I learn to cope with all of the emotional and Mm, environmental factors that are going on around me as I'm trying to get sober when I've used my less healthy outlets as a way of coping. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the issues are still there. As a person stops using or moderates their use or moves back along the scale, those issues are still present or may still be present. They still may be hungry. They still may have not mm -hmm. um, a safe place to live. They still may have someone in the family who's health is compromised or um, who's dying and coping with it without their outlet is very difficult. Yeah. So a person can become abstinent, but there's, that's when some of the more difficult work begins. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. certainly. And, and I, I think that, um, <clears throat> I think that what we're touching on and one of the main goals of the American Society of Addiction Medicine with, with the expanded definition is to kind of tease out some of the nuances of addiction. That we can't expect, if we look at people and just say, your addiction is a manifestation of brain circuitry, will help you to change around brain circuitry, but then you'll be in the same environment that fed into causing your addiction. Maybe there'll be problems with poverty, maybe there'll be problems with housing, maybe there'll be problems with employment, maybe there'll be unresolved trauma. How can we expect people to just stop using drugs and not have an environment that welcomes them and continue to be abstinent from drugs? So the idea then is that this new definition would begin to inform the public so we would enact legislation and programs that would begin to deal with adverse childhood experiences, lack of employment, lack of housing, things of that nature, and mental health. What have you, I mean, what have you seen in your, in your, in your practices that, that, that speaks to that, like the absence of resources in the environment that sometimes cause a person to resume the self-administration of drugs? In, mm, let's say, the early 90s, we didn't address co-occurring psychiatric disorders until the person had been sober for X number of weeks. Mm -hmm. the, the tricyclic antidepressants were much more toxic. And if someone relapsed into alcohol or other substance use on top of that, there could be more critical problems. With the advent of the SSRIs and realizing that you can't do treatment sequentially, you have to do it in a coordinated manner, even mm -hmm. parallel treatment doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So how do you you can't send a person's addiction to an addiction specialist and their uh, mental health issues to a mental health right. specialist. You have to deal with the, the whole person. Mm -hmm. That's becoming more the norm. It used to be co-occurring, dual diagnosis, then it was co-occurring, and much more we're talking about a complex patient mm -hmm. who may have a variety of issues that need to be dealt with simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. That's been a big, a big change over the last 30 years. Yeah, and in, in Vermont, I know because I'm a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, uh, when, when we adopted licensure, part of the requirement for licensure was a master's degree in mental health. So in order to get a licensure for dealing with people with alcohol or drug uh, issues, 
you had to also have a, a, a master's degree in mental health. So that integration began to occur there. What about, what about have you made those observations also? Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> particularly when you're looking at individuals, in, it's sort of like this process of, you know, here's your laid out path to what treatment might look like for you, but unfortunately they have to return to that same environment. So, and it's also asking a lot for them to, okay, can you just up and leave everything to go to a residential care facility to get stabilized on medication to engage in programming? And then, so do you have the finances in order mm -hmm. to give up 28 days of work or 14 days of work, however long the stay is? Do you have care in place for your children if you have children? Um, <clears throat> also, like, you know, are you going to be able to afford rent? Are you, are you going to be able to pay for food for your family mm -hmm. if you're the sole provider? So it's asking a lot for people to do that. Sure. And then sure. whenever they leave the treatment center and they've, they've completed their treatment and their programming and they're stabilized on medication and they've returned back to that environment, they're still amidst everything. They still have the barriers in place. They still have the financial stressors. Mm -hmm. um, and everything there is just significant for them. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. to continue the next step, it's difficult because they have to dive back into work. They have to make up for the past month's losses to get back into the financial black. Yeah, you know? yeah there's a lot of um, obstacles, roadblocks, uh, barriers, mm -hmm. uh, things that you've mentioned. One of, one of the things that's happening in, in Vermont now that's very encouraging um, is that there's movement uh, in housing, there's movement in transportation, there's movement in, in employment all to, to educate um, significant leaders about like the nature of addiction and the nature of recovery. Um, recovery supportive workplaces is something that's being discussed and defined and different conferences are going to be looking at that. Um, recovery supportive communities, there are a few communities in Vermont where there are really integrated um, avenues supporting recovery. So as a state, we are, we're moving forward. It's always an uphill kind of a movement, but we really are um, moving forward. One of the things I wanted to touch upon was, this is national in, in nature, but it's, it speaks to this idea of moving forward. This is a resolution by United States Representative Ted Budd that was introduced on November 19th. It's a House resolution. One point, I'll, I'll, I'll quote it. One point will be to start recognizing addiction as a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experience. So that's taken directly from the ASAM medication. Um, the resolution will also support evidence-based treatment. Um, along biological, psychological, and social lines. And the third one, which I think is really important and which I'd like to speak to, it, it will support efforts to prevent and destigmatize substance use disorder and addiction. So this is a national effort. This is a House resolution that embodies exactly what we're talking about today. It's not a cure for anything, but again, it's one small step uphill but in the right in the right direction. Would you let's talk a little bit about that? When we look at the environment, one of the environmental dynamics that people with addiction face is stigma. Would you care to comment on that? Sure. Um, so with uh, medication, uh, medication assisted treatment, uh, it has a it has a name, right? Medication assisted treatment. But why isn't it just medication? So there's one instance right there. So changing the language and the terminology, understanding that it's medication. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a disease where, you know, just like most chronic diseases, it's not just one treatment fits all. Mm -hmm. You need to sort of take into account the environmental factors, uh, the adverse childhood experiences, so that everyone's own sort of presence of addiction in their life could be different from another's. Mm -hmm. So that what my treatment 
for the same sort of, you know, what would be uh, a chronic disease when it might necessarily not be the same for somebody else's As chronic mine. disease. <clears throat> exactly. Um, so I might have some allergies to some medications where you, so you get the gist here. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was, it was brought up earlier just in a conversation that we had sort of like a microcosm versus a macrocosm of what stigma, stigma looks like. And so I can speak from my experience of stigma in the recovery community, particularly to a 12-step fellowship, yeah. that there is significant stigma facing towards individuals who use medication that's derived from those who are this strictly abstinent-based sure. recovery path. Sure. Um, it's sort of like a sense of you know elite elitism that comes from it, the sense of uh, purity. I you know, I I don't really know because I I, I can only speculate to the experience, uh, but I've seen it. I think I think this, I think this is a really important area. So why don't mm -hmm. we just stay in this area? for a while. So what you're talking about is uh, a stigma placed on people with addiction mm -hmm. who are receiving a, a medication for addiction treatment. Mm -hmm. And the stigma is coming nonetheless from people who are also in uh, recovery, mm -hmm. but are more in recovery based on an abstinence-based program. Mm -hmm. You care to speak uh, to that, uh, Todd? Well, it's been an evolution as most parts of recovery have been. Um, the fact that methadone is probably the most highly studied medicine in all the pharmacopoeia of medicine doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people. And yet it saves lives, it helps. Buprenorphine, when it was released to say, right, so you don't have to go to a clinic necessarily, you can go to a doctor's office that has the proper training. Um, the efforts to train and it was only allowed by physicians to use it initially. Now it's been open to um, NPPAs, as we, nurse practitioners, physicians' assistants, to be able to prescribe it. How to recruit folks to be able to use it mm -hmm. was um, a large effort. And Vermont did a really nice job in leading the country in, in training the number of providers that have the buprenorphine <coughs> license. It was interesting that this is the first medication, buprenorphine, that requires an eight-hour training. Mm -hmm. Most medicines you read, mm -hmm. you read a little bit about it and you That's it. discuss it with a colleague and you jump on ahead. So who is going to be providing it? Whose patient is it that's your patient? Todd, people would say, you have that patient, you do that for them. Well, how about the fact that they're, they have hypertension, they may have diabetes, they may have a... Um, a mental health issue that needs to be on medication, how do we coordinate that, your patient? Mm -hmm. So now it's becoming more of an our patient. And that's, that's um, Representative Bud's issue is, he, he says very clearly in that um, document, people with addictions might not present for treatment because they're afraid of the stigmatization exactly. that they may exactly. experience when they come in. So it's within and without of the recovering community. And it's a slow process, but uh, Representative Bud made a really nice start with that. Yeah. Putting it on paper is unfortunately different than having people absorb it mm -hmm. and to practice mm -hmm. it to not be stigmatizing. We all have our blind spots, but how do we learn to work past them? And how do we not exclude people from the treatment that they really need? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly, and and, 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 and and well said by by you both. The, the fact of the matter is that stigma costs lives, and the general public needs to be gently educated about that. Stigma causes people with severe substance use disorder to be reluctant to reach out for help. When they don't reach out for help, the disease progresses, and in our society with some of the drugs that are available on our streets today that can uh, very often lead to, to death. I have a, a quote from, this is the Betty Ford um, consensus panel on recovery. And one of their criteria for recovery is what they call sobriety. And I'll just read you the footnote because it bears directly on what we're saying. The Betty Ford Foundation says, the consensus panel agreed that individuals engaged in medication-assisted treatment 
who meet the other criteria for sobriety would meet consensus definition of sobriety. So what they're saying then is a person who is receiving buprenorphine or methadone will be considered in recovery if they're adhering to you know, the prescription and the way that their uh, medication is supposed to be taken. And this is, again, the beginning of like a, the expansion of consciousness to include people. Mm -hmm. To me, and I, I know a lot of people in recovery, to me it's heartbreaking that someone with such a, a dangerous disease, uh, opioid addiction, would first have to battle the stigma of, you know, I'm not even going to say the word, but you are a so-and-so. You know, you choose this. You made your bed sleep in it. That's the initial stigma that they face. Then, if they're lucky or fortunate enough or have the resources and they get into treatment and they're on buprenorphine or methadone, they're met with the feeling of you're still using your medication is opioid based, so you're still using. How how are, are that's we are the environment. This is part of the environment that we create. What what can people do? What can the general public do to change that environment around? How can we how can we change that? I'd actually like to hear from you, Cam, about the role of the recovery coaches and how Basically, you're helping folks walk through that, shepherding them, helping them, assisting them through those issues. And I'd like to hear more, since mm -hmm. it's fairly new, mm -hmm. I'd like to hear more from you about how mm -hmm. you and the other folks that you work with actually manage that, mm -hmm. help folks manage it, I should say. Of course. Um, so really, it depends. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I don't necessarily agree mm. with that. Um, <clears throat> to set uh, parameters around somebody else's kind of experience, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what's true to them and what is subjective to them, mm -hmm. I feel like that does a disservice mm -hmm. to that person. And in, in sort of, you know, not in what we do as recovery coaches, we help align sort of parameters and expectations for individuals mm -hmm. and what is reasonable for them to accomplish. So helping them sort of come up with motivation, helping really create a sense of autonomy through just dialogue mm -hmm. and having an open um, dialogue session with them at various points of intervention. Um, we sort of create this sense of belief that you know, I might not be able to do this right now, but I can do this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of inching the person towards this larger goal of what might be their understanding mm -hmm. of sobriety. Mm -hmm. Because for me to say, well, you know what, according to Betty Ford, this is what sobriety is and you're not living up to it. Therefore, you're not sober. You know, like it's kind of a no, no. weird Be sense. Betty, Betty Ford, but the consensus panel on Betty Ford is mm -hmm. that you are considered sober even if you're on buprenorphine or mm -hmm. methadone, mm -hmm. whereas one of the general stigmas that, that we're seeing is that parts of the recovery community are saying you're not in recovery if you're on methadone or buprenorphine. Which I get, yeah. 100%, yeah. and I agree, yeah. but there's another level mm -hmm. to it. So outside of medication, there's also use of other substances. Right. Oh, I Although see. not I see. the same substance that's causing the sincere problems sure. in the person's life. So sure. if somebody who is uh, IV use heroin every single day mm -hmm. and they're able to get to a place where they're not, mm -hmm. but they're smoking weed mm -hmm. or they're using benzodiazepines mm -hmm. or they're you know, using crack okay. cocaine, it's okay. not as problematic as it was in the past. Mm -hmm. So from their understanding, they are in a better place. Oh yeah, for sure. So that is, you know, it's, it's working, it's a sort of a harm reduction approach. Oh, for sure. Applied Absolutely. to getting to a person to a place where they feel comfortable enough mm -hmm. to kind of see like recovery, this is my lifestyle that I'm living now. <clears throat> it's a tall order to have sort of this expectation of, you know, 
uh, committing to a sense of sobriety for the mm -hmm. person. I got it. I see when what they're not saying. in the place. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's it. And you know, it gets it gets really complicated. Mm -hmm. But but I, I'm with you. Uh, you know, Betty Ford is one resource, and I think they've made progress in kind of stating that people on opioid based med based medications can be in recovery. Mm -hmm. If you look at William White and and some of his writings, he kind of addresses part of what you're saying. It's kind of a harm reduction idea. He will uh, differentiate three stages of recovery. Mm -hmm. one, one is partial, which is what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. People are still you know, dealing with maybe harm reduction or the recurrence of use. They're kind of still struggling. Mm -hmm. The next phase is full. Where people are abstinent, you know, from all dangerous psychoactive chemicals, and they're leading rewarding lives, uh, improving their health, improving their um, participation in the community. And then the third really is is beautiful. It's enriched, where the person's experience achieving recovery has shaped them in ways that enable them to give back mm -hmm. to the community of people who are using substances and. and and, and, and fighting for recovery and helping them to move forward. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a, you know, a very, um, like a rich kind of way to define stages that we can't really see things in black and white. And I think that's what you're talking about is harm reduction and gradual movement forward and respecting the person no matter where they are in that process. Is that, is that, Kind of what you're saying? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Um, you know, I don't like to give it labels because it would be subjective to mm -hmm. each person. But mm -hmm. I, I, I wholly agree, and I think, you know, and, and and I understand like along the process, you know, I can't say, and this is kind of like a recovery coach sort of quip here. Like, I can't say I'm the expert on somebody else's own reality. Like, they're the expert right. on their reality. Mm -hmm. So when we work with people, whether it's um, in an inpatient setting, if they're admitted to the hospital, or if it's in a recovery setting. And if they're in very, throughout the various stages, um, whether in their sort of that partial, um, you know, all the way up to enriched, mm -hmm. as you stated yeah. earlier, like it's really a similar process yeah. where you have sort of, you know, this understanding that they're where they're at right now and we have to meet them exactly where they're at mm -hmm. and provide them with the support so that they can continue. Well, I mean, that really answers my initial question about what, what can we do to reduce stigma and help people to move forward in recovery, if we can spread that kind of attitude a little more to the general public by educating them, then that's that's really what we need to do over time. Yeah. Todd? Well, educating the public, but also providing the support and education within the community of folks who are working on recovery so that they don't fall victim to this stigma. And whether it's that I'm on methadone and I'm not being accepted by NA, or yeah. I'm on, I use alcohol and I am on antidepressants, which didn't used to be allowed mm -hmm. in, in, or wasn't as, as that, <clears throat> rather than saying that, wasn't as accepted mm -hmm. by all meetings. So how do we negotiate that? Mm -hmm. And how do we help care providers mm -hmm. negotiate that, have a better understanding about what it's like to face, to be afraid to, to ask for help, what it's like when um, you're judged yeah. in an emergency room. Mm -hmm. How do we help someone manage that and avoid, use in semantics, the tiniest things can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And saying that someone has an addiction difficulty as opposed to being an addict yeah. Mm -hmm. opens up a door in a different way. How do we use the, the better vocabulary, the more accepting words, mm -hmm. um, more support? How can I help you today as opposed to your drug seeking? All of those, they are significant, but they, they're also very small yeah. changes that one has to make in order to be have a welcoming environment. Yeah, yeah. You know, so there, there's that, and also, you know, what I think about frequently is, is the way the care uh, provider or the recovery coach or the therapist or the neighbor mm -hmm. like feels inside about the person with addiction that, that somehow 
that that gets communicated, mm -hmm. and um, you know that we all need to educate ourselves more about what addiction is and what people with addiction go through, so we can really like feel compassion. And I, and I know that both of you are still in in practice. You're still working with individuals. I no longer am in clinical practice, but. <clears throat> Maybe we can talk a little bit about that, like the, the sensitivity that you experience toward people and the sensitivity that they bring into the office. In my experience, people with addiction by far are, are like overly sensitive to stigma. They will, they will have feelers out, mm -hmm. and if they feel it emanating from someone, that will push them away. And it, it seems to be an obligation, really, uh, for the for the service professionals, really, to to deal with whatever they have to do, whatever education or therapy, or consulting or supervision, or whatever they have to do, to get down in there and make sure that they have the the right kind of attitude toward the people that they're they're working with. Do you want to comment on that? I was actually hoping that you could walk us through a little scenario of someone that you're coaching who mm -hmm. is experiencing mm -hmm. stigma mm -hmm. from whatever um, vantage point from their family, from mm -hmm. a provider, from whoever, and how you might help them deal with it. Mm -hmm. how, would you, how might you approach someone who said, this has happened to me, or I'm not feeling welcome at this meeting because I'm on methadone. How might you help them manage it because it's a tr it's a relapse trigger mm -hmm. yeah completely um, so what I what I can speak about has that has occurred pretty much um, sequentially over the course of a year and a half that I've been working um, in the emergency department is individuals uh, re-engaging with treatment through the emergency department and it has been pretty rapid so it's about three four five six times a month that it's occurring mm. and Every single time, they, they're a bit less willing to engage as a result of encountering stigma through staff. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of that look, it's that tone, it's sort of that sense. They're, they're very sensitive to that sense of, well, they don't want me here. You know, clearly I'm not going to get the best treatment. And then it turns into just, you know, uh, cognitive distortion and then it turns into a belief and it's just then it's a core belief that the person and then they're unwilling a core belief about self a core belief about self right yeah right and then they're unwilling to seek out treatment as a result so and that's when we lose people that's when we lose lives um, what we do in a sense is we really provide that compassion and support for people so that where they are seeking it out in different venues and they're not having it reciprocated to the sense where they need that, we'll then provide it. <clears throat> and also what we'll do is we'll sort of, um, it will de we'll debrief in a sense. You know, they go to this, they go to a meeting or they engage in treatment and then we'll debrief afterwards. Okay, so what did you hear? Did you hear anything? Did, did, you, did you take anything personal? So in a sense of like what came up that you felt was sort of targeted against you. That's, that's, you I know? know that. That's and then good. talk through it because it could just be misunderstandings. It could mm -hmm. be you take something and you misconstrue it in your mo own mind. Um, when I first got sober, I felt everybody was staring at me. Mm -hmm. I felt everybody was talking about how I wasn't speaking right and I'm from Baltimore and we have a really weird accent so and up here it's a very thick drawn out yeah but how's it you know it's very Vermont and so there's this sort of um, you know you're in a spotlight and you feel like you're in a spotlight even when engaging in treatment when you first go to the emergency department you go you know there's that sense of well I'm not here for a medical reason you know well, this also, kind of you know, the, yeah the, there's the overlap between adverse childhood experiences and addiction, mm -hmm. and children with adverse childhood experiences by and by having what's called um, early stress response or early fear response, they're like ready to bolt, ready to bolt. You can assume that really, in my experience, about practically everyone with addiction, they're ready to bolt. Mm -hmm. They're ready to be rejected, they're ready to be misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So they bring that to the setting and it takes a real inner peace 
on the part of the provider to engage that and de-escalate that. And you're right, any, a look, um, body language, mm -hmm. it could be a, you know, a professional that's just busy mm -hmm. that really doesn't contain any stigma, but they're busy and it appears that they don't care. Mm -hmm. Little things like that can cost lives. And I know you're both acutely aware of that because you deal with that yeah. every day. I, the idea of debriefing mm -hmm. with a patient, that was a little, I, I like that. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Do you have protocols for that or, you know, ways that you, are you documenting or you may be developing some kind of literature where you're going to be teaching mm -hmm. people how to do that? Because that to me is really important. We're, we're in the process. I mean, the protocol is continuously evolving as the program develops. You know, nothing is consistent mm -hmm. right now, especially when you work in a hospital. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, we we have the ten day follow up, which kind of turns into a month to two months, however long, that a person wishes to work with us. And when working in an outpatient setting as a recovery coach, you're meeting with people at a coffee shop or the the recovery center. You're you're meeting them where they're at. Um, it's really the coach's own responsibility to kind of create that sense of support. Mm -hmm. um, so it's you know. It's up to the coach and what they wish to do at that time, mm -hmm. but they're all skilled enough to go through that process and mm -hmm. debrief and, you know. I like and, that. And what, 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 I'm sorry. I like the debrief, it's a reality test. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was this really what you were thinking, your old stuff, or was it just someone was busy? Mm -hmm. Or when you need to go back there next time, how do you advocate for yourself better? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like yeah. that. How do you advocate for yourself better? Mm -hmm. And what about, what about the medical profession itself? I mean, when, when doctors are trained, um, I mean, people with other diseases also can, can present a situation that causes like a, a negative uh, response mm -hmm. or a stigma-based response. Are doctors, uh, how, are they, how are they trained around responding to patients in a compassionate way? Is that, is that part of what, what goes on, or is that just considered to be sort of, you, you bring that to your role naturally? Well, there's much more attention to the process of addiction than there had been when I was in training. Mm -hmm. Wasn't mentioned any more than nutrition was mentioned more than an hour in all of mm -hmm. medical school and residency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So things are evolving. Um, how? How do you approach, how does a, a practitioner in early training, and all practitioners, not just the docs, how do you approach something that may make you uncomfortable? Yeah. And remembering to leave that at the door and to remember that everyone who's coming in to see you is not feeling good. They're unhappy, they're feeling terrible. How do you, no matter what the issue is that's bringing them, how do you approach that in a compassionate way? It's... Um, mm -hmm. Certainly an expectation, we, across the board, <clears throat> as a society, we could do better at it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, thank you for your, your candor about that. And, and um, you know, we're certainly, <clears throat> you know, motivated by, by powerful forces today to evaluate everything we do and, um, and get better at everything we do. Yeah. You know, the... Um, Representative Bud's resolution, I just want to point out, was of course endorsed strongly by the American Society of Addiction Medicine because it closely reflects their definition of addiction. But in addition to ASAM, there were 14 other organizations that endorsed the bill. And there are organizations such as the American College of Medical Toxicology, the American College of Emergency Physicians, the American Osteopathic Academy of Addiction Medicine, and the American Psychological Association. That's just a small group. There were 14. So there's, there's momentum, there's force behind getting this message out um, to America, <clears throat> you know, and... Um, I want to thank you both. I mean, I think we're all part of that force, and I want to thank you both for um, being here today. 
We'll close the show now, and as I am in the habit of doing, I like my guests to close the show with whatever message they have for the um, for the viewing audience. So, Cam, would you like to take the lead on that? Sure. Um, you know, I like to go onto news sites on Facebook, and and I like to go in the comments, and I like to be a fly on the wall. Yeah. And kind of see the dialogue, because I think, you know, aside from the Russian bots and, you know, all the other stuff that's happening, the political discourse, because that's where the true kind of understanding of what addiction mm -hmm. is, and that's the kind of language that is um, hurting people, Yeah. right? And th so that's to the broader public, the people who might not watch the show, the people who might not pay attention to the uh, American Psy uh, Psychiatric Association. They might not, you know. So I like to see what, what they're saying. And it kind of leads to the point of, you know, they made that choice. They made that choice, yeah. you know? Yeah. <clears throat> and from my experience and what I've seen and what I've lived through, that there was a choice at the beginning, but there was a lot of external factors playing into that choice being made. So when I mentioned that my father passing away, my mother having a life-threatening illness, uh, me having to live with my, my grandparents, and you know this whole whirlwind of stuff, yeah. and then still this thought of cancer coming back into my mother's life, and you know this, this sense of worry just throughout, there was something that sort of kind of pushed my hand into making that choice of, you know what, this kind of makes me feel better. I'm going to keep doing this. So it's like, you know, you make that choice to go swimming. Why do you go swimming? Because it feels better, right? You do it because you enjoy it. But then when you're out swimming, you think, I got this. I'm so strong. I can swim against the current. Next thing you know, the current's taking you out to sea. You're in a riptide. Yeah. Um, what do I do here? It's okay. It's all right. I can manage it, right? You're still playing. It's okay. It's all right. I can swim out to the side, I can swim. But then eventually you're 100 yards out to sea and nobody can get you. And, and, and exhausted. <clears throat> yeah, and you drown. And it's, it's, it's brutal yeah. to see that. So, I mean, that's a beautiful description of, of the innocence of addiction and how it occurs over time mm -hmm. outside the person's experience. Mm -hmm. You make choices but you never choose addiction. Mm. You choose relief of suffering, pleasure, improved self-esteem, mm -hmm. social connectedness, comfort, the things that drugs bring you temporarily, while under the surface there's actually something happening in a cellular way in your brain. Mm. And before you know it, you need a drug just to feel normal. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to do anything to get the drug. Mm -hmm. And you have addiction. Yep. Yeah, this is something that we need to keep talking about so people can really understand it. That was a beautiful rendition of it. Yeah, I want to see those Facebook comments kind of change. But, but do you get... Look do you, a little different. Do you get into it? Years. Do you get into like... No, no, sir. Because it can take all day. Sometimes no, I will get sucked I, into it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to have peace of mind. At the end of the day, so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that, yeah, Todd. Right. <clears throat> oh, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting swimming metaphor. I like it very much. May I use it? Mm, okay. <laughs> small strokes, small steps, small changes in language, changes in legislation, more support, more recognition that this is a problem. We have a long way to go, but we're making progress, and we just have to stick with it. Thank you, Tan. <clears throat> Thanks for having me back. Thank so thank you for uh, joining us again for part two, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next time on the Addiction Recovery Channel. <clears throat> Thanks, Todd. Cam, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, man.